Okay, good morning. Uh, it seems that uh, we are getting better at being on time. I mean, it's 10 o'clock and we have the fourth installment of the Science at 10. And uh, today we have Jacob who is going to talk about have the aftermath of the forest says here and uh, about green economy, where is red and uh, maybe a little bit of where is biodiversity, but mainly about red, green investment and does it create a transition towards the green economy? And it's derived from a chapter of a book that they are currently developing or it's already published? I'm uh, sure. Published later this year. Okay, so your turn. Thanks. Thanks very much. No, I think, I think I'm fine here. Thanks. So yeah, I, I recently finished a book chapter uh, for the Oxford Biodiversity Institute. Uh, and they were interested in biodiversity and, and these emerging green economy ideas. This started a couple of years ago, now be published later this year by Rutledge. And in the spirit of Science at 10 talks, and especially following the Forest Asia Summit, I thought it was a good opportunity to think a little bit about how these emerging green economy principles relate to our work, particularly on red, and also to provide perhaps a counterpoint to some of the optimism that seems to be characterizing the contemporary work on green economy. And so to start off with, I, I'm sure you've got the question of exactly what is the green economy. And, and to be fair, I think that these are definitions and mechanisms that are still being debated and, and considered. But there's a couple of things that seem that, that are solidifying in terms of the green economy vision. And that's that, as the UNEP puts it, in its simplest expression, a green economy is low carbon, resource efficient, and socially inclusive. So within this, it sees, it sees economic growth not as incongruous, but rather as capable of supporting not only economic objectives, but environmental objectives, uh, social, so human development and social equity objectives, and all jointly. And it does this uh, with a very particular vision. That's that the valuation of natural capital is front and center in drawing that economic transition. And it sees the private sector as a primary actor in that transition. Private sector finance is going to be the engine that drives this transition. And the state's role within that uh, is perhaps a little bit relegated to one of enabler, creating enabling conditions, uh, creating supporting finance guidelines to help uh, facilitate that transition. So of course the green economy covers a huge range of sectors. Uh, for our purposes, we're perhaps most interested in how green finance into the forestry sector, and perhaps in the case of red, green finance valuation of carbon, can drive multiple objectives for economy, for society, and for environment. Uh, and so as I mentioned, red is, a, red is a great starting point for thinking about uh, green economy within the forest sector. A key question that I have within this is to what extent does green investment into forest carbon drive these green economic transitions that we've envisaged? And to this, to this aim, I'd like to draw on two questions from the chapter. And the first is, to what extent is red an engine of economic growth? And the second is, in what way is red engaging the private sector? These are two basic premises of the green economy, and so they, I think they merit evaluation. Uh, especially because the green economy, again, not only f focuses very much on continued growth, but it doesn't necessarily see changes in rates of returns. And again, it sees the private sector as front and center. So in fact, there's, there's considerable reason to think that green economy and red concepts are, are highly, uh, highly linked. Uh, because red yields a range of economic gains, most notably red payments. Uh, which don't necessarily reckon, uh, represent gains, but they certainly don't, they, the idea through opportunity costs is that they shouldn't represent losses to, to the communities and to the countries that are participating. But beyond that, if we think about carbon MRV jobs, which go down to the community level, there's are new economic opportunities. Forestry sector jobs, firefighting, uh, you know, in Riau, these are all potentially sites of economic gains. Uh, but they're not only direct economic gains, there's also potentially downstream economic gains. If we think about improved forest management, of course, sustainable forest management and sustainable extraction are areas for economic growth, continued economic growth. Potentially ecotourism has been flagged by UNEP as an area for continued economic growth. And in turn, these red areas of growth, economic growth, are supported by green economy concepts that I mentioned earlier. Notably, valuation of natural capital, Finance is red, which then yields economic growth. And also this idea that the state is providing enabling conditions, frameworks, as well as startup capital to, to allow these mechanisms to run. So there's no reason to think that they're not necessarily uh, reinforcing. 
And these sites, as, as, as far as the story goes to that point, these sites are win-wins, and I think they certainly make sense to capitalize on. The issue is that a lot of the green economy and green economy red literature to date ends the story there. Uh, and in fact, I think we know from our work at C4 that green investments, including into red and forest carbon, also involve losses, economic losses, and or changes in rates of return. And I think that these need to be considered a little bit further. And these are not only economic, direct economic losses, you know, changes in how we can harvest timber, limitations on where agriculture can expand into, changes in mining practices, or, or withdrawing of concessions. These are, these are fairly obvious sites of potential economic loss. But there's a range of indirect economic losses that I think need to be targeted. And the case of Southeast Asian oil palm, of course, is a low-hanging fruit for these types of discussions. Uh, and they're important. As we consider, as we ask ourselves the question, what happens when we move investment from business as usual scenarios of deforestation followed by oil palm expansion, and we move that into a green investment, into forest carbon, or into sustainable forest management, or what have you? What are the economic ramifications of that transition? Well, of course, there, as I mentioned, there are some direct losses. 30-year uh, net present values for one hectare of oil palm in Malaysia, four to $10,000 per hectare. And then if we add on to that the dollars generated by deforestation that may have preceded that, that agricultural development, another 10 for lowland Southeast Asian forests, another 10 to $13,000 per hectare. So pretty significant targets, and as we know well from work at C4, difficult economic targets to match with red payments. But, but that aside, there's a number of other costs that I'd like to, that I'd like to flag. Um, and that's, of course, for example, the upstream costs. If we transition from, from red, excuse me, if we transition from business as usual to red, what are the upstream costs that, that would hit on the oil palm industry? Resource and development, machinery, transportation, road development. And then what about the downstream economic costs? Malaysian Oil Palm uh, Council estimates, what, nearly 600,000 people directly employed by the oil palm industry, but another 830,000 employed in downstream activities of sorting, grading, processing, transport. And so what happens when we move our investments from business as usual towards green, we need to consider potentially some of these downstream impacts. And of course, we also then need to consider revenues to the state. Oil palm, for example, is Malaysia's most, one of Ma Malaysia's most highly taxed sectors. It's not only corporate tax, it's got a specific you know, sales tax, and now as of last year, a new windfall tax. When prices hit a certain amount, there's an additional tax levied on them. So if we move from that towards green economic investments, what does that necessarily mean for the state coffers, which of course then have trickle downs to education, healthcare, infrastructure? And if we continue our accounting exercise a little bit deeper, and we start to think about future development, the reality is, for better or for worse, oil palm represents a sector for tr of tremendous growth. And that's not only in terms of expansion of area, but also in terms of downstream processing. Malaysia and Indonesia have targets to increase domestic processing uh, and refining of, of all sorts of uh, oil palm products. And that represents a potential source of huge economic future growth. And if we continue the accounting exercise even further, we can also think about global economic implications. The reality is we know that a range of economic sectors rely heavily on cheap, cheap oil palm. Uh, biofuels is an obvious example, but also uh, cosmetics, food, industrial products. And so if we move from continued oil palm and towards green investments uh, that may or may not involve oil palm in the same way, what cost does that represent for global industry? Oil palm, 2012-2013 uh, price is about $750 per metric ton. If we move forward, the next cheapest option is coconut, $100 more per metric ton. Soybean, rapeseed, sunflower, between $300 to $1,000 or $1,100 more per metric ton. So significant impacts. So when we consider the economic impacts of green investments, particularly where these replace business as usual scenarios, we need perhaps a more full accounting. And I think when we do, what appears is that things that seem to look like both gains for environment and economy perhaps are not quite so. More likely than not, this is where we begin to face trade-offs, which is a word that, that, that we use plenty in our work. <coughs> Another hallmark of the green economy is this private sector engagement. And as we know that these are principal factors uh, within the green economy vision, but red has taught us overwhelmingly are very challenging to address. The green economy fundamentally depends on this private sector buy-in, and we focus very heavily on how can we create enabling conditions and incentives to engage them. 
But as we've seen with the, with the carbon markets, there's also potentially a need for mandated private sector engagement. Uh, in the case of RED, this potentially means we've discussed a climate agreement to ensure that there's global demand for carbon credits. But in the green economy, this potentially is not only about incentives and social responsibility on behalf of the private sector, but on developing, establishing environmental taxes and emissions taxes, as well as guidelines that clearly direct private sector to incorporate natural capital into their accounting. Not as voluntary activities, but perhaps as mandated activities. Financing simply cannot be an afterthought. But as we know, taxes, regulations, these are dirty words. They're difficult issues to address. And yet, they're, they're, they're profoundly ingrained in this economic vision that, we, that is being laid forward. And what I would like to see is a really frank and upfront discussion about the hard topics and not only about the, the easier ones, about uh, private sector, you know, voluntary compliance and, and incentives. You know, the, the, the existing green economy literature, I guess my issue with is that it focuses very much on the optimistic win-win cases. And we know that those are out there, including within the forestry sector. And in so much as they're out there, they make sense to take advantage of. But we know better than most here at C4 that environment development decisions are often about trade-offs. C4's red work has also highlighted that while economic valuation of natural capital is a very powerful policy tool, it's grossly incomplete in terms of providing a solution. The GCS has highlighted issues of tenure, finance, monitoring, participation in equity. All of these things need to happen alongside. Similarly, natural capital accounting within the green economy needs to consider this broader context. And we know there are no easy solutions. Now, a lot of heads shaking. I mean, this is, this is no news to us at C4. And yet we find ourselves again faced with a policy that's been diluted by what McShane et al. called in a great paper in 2011, the rhetorical elegance of the win-win paradigm. In giving excessive credence to easy solutions, the emerging green economic frame avoids difficult choices. It depoliticizes environment development decision making. And as we know, these types of policy frames affect the way we as researchers, but also as policymakers, the public at large, understand, engage with, and deal with hard choices. Uh, so the heavy focus on win-win, my concern is that by engaging with it in only win-win terms, it, it weakens our critical thinking, it compromises political will, and it makes difficult decisions uh, seem potentially easy. There are potentially not deep costs associated with these. And in fact, we know that dealing with these trade-offs is inherently political because trade-offs are negotiated, and that negotiation is often very hard. Gains in one ecosystem, service losses in others. Gain for one community, losses for another. And so dealing with these trade-offs requires not only that we acknowledge them and that we, deal, that, we, that we recognize them, that we come up with ways in which to deal with them. And I think that that's the task. And those are the debates that we need to have more aggressively as part of a broader discussion about incentives and corporate social responsibility. And so in conclusion, it's, it's not that I'm unenthusiastic about a green economy transformation. We, we, we need to better account for externalities. We need to engage the private sector. And natural capital can be a really powerful tool through which to achieve that. But win-wins are exceptional. We know that from our work. And trade-offs have to be candidly confronted. The private sector has vested interests. They can be a, they can be a, they can be a partner. But there's also a need to consider the role of the state in this. And the state is not merely one that can level the green economic playing field. The state guides, the state mandates, the state regulates, the state enforces. And I think that these are issues that we need to, we need to continue to keep within our research portfolio. So I hope that this quite brief Science at 10 uh, discussion creates a space that we can have a bit more discussion about these difficult trade-offs within our institution. Because much like 2007 red optimism, I'm very confident that we're going to see an increasingly analytic and critical body of work on the green economy. And I think we're very well placed to, to be at the forefront of that effort. Thank you. Thank you. So now, now that we have transformed red into green, uh, maybe we can have some sort of aggressively constructive discussion in terms of what is the shade of green we have. The floor is open. Thanks. So in the first part of your talk, when you were talking about trade-offs and talking about sort of this transformation of the green economy from business as usual, from oil palms to natural capital through other kinds of things, 
there was an implication, and I don't think you necessarily meant it, but there was an implication at that paying attention to it more critically means paying attention to how those externality could be included in them. So it sounds like in the second part of your talk, you're making a different kind of argument than in the first part, part of your talk, right? And what I'm, I want you to clarify, how would your response to the green economy folks is, what they're trying to do is actually take account of the externalities and make them internalities, right? Let's make natural capital, social capital, let's put it into the same economic system. You, so in the first part of your talk, that's kind of what would be stressed or that, that's the way it would be taken. In the second part of your talk, you're making a different kind of argument. Can you clarify? I think that's, I think that's very fair and it, and, it, and it hits to an unease that I have and I know that Kieran also has with this move uh, towards, you know, towards, towards monetizing everything. Um, so at the beginning of my talk, I'm talking specifically within the red bubble rather than within the green economy bubble. And the red bubble values only a l very limited set, I mean, basically one ecosystem service and a couple of co-benefits that are added on which may or may not be valued. Um, so as far as we're thinking about how red integrates into this broader ec green economy, if we adopt that language and we, we accept, which perhaps we shouldn't, the assumption that we're going to value all of these things, if we do value, I'm just highlighting how red would have to be placed within a much, much broader context. But as, as we've highlighted in a number of our discussions, there's, so not only do we need to be critical of how that's placed within this broader context and what that actual accounting would look like and how complex it would be, um, but then we also need, I think, as you overwhelmingly know, we need to also be critical of, of that kind of blanket acceptance of we're going to value everything. Because assuming that market solutions are going to get us out of the hole that market you know, solutions have, have drawn us into is, is, a, is a big leap of faith. And also once these things start to happen, you know, they, there's, there's a very kind of technological imperative about them. And it's very difficult to go back. Uh, so I think that maybe explains both trying to engage with this, this, this emerging framework, but also cautiously questioning it. Two quick questions. I think you skipped over quite quickly the whole issue of opportunity costs and the extent to which red is likely to be financed. And you, you recall at the C4 annual meeting last year, quite a lot of evidence was presented in terms of the extent to which red has been capitalized in terms of the opportunities. Uh, and there's an Indonesian woman who's just successfully defended her PhD at ANU in Australia, who has estimated as part of her thesis that the current opportunity cost for red per ton uh, in, in terms of being able to compete with oil palm investments is currently about $58, she uh, suggests. And I checked this morning, the over-the-counter price for carbon at the moment is less than a dollar. So I wanted to ask, to what extent do you think that financing gap is ever going to be approached? Well, uh, And the second one is, in terms of your last comments, uh, Jakob, about the externalities, do you think in the next round of the negotiations for the climate change agreement, the current lack of integrity vis-a-vis -vis the UNFCC, vis-a-vis -vis taking into account trade-based emissions will be included in the next agreement? Some scholars have estimated by 2020 that will represent more than the total emissions associated with land use, land cover change. Sorry, what will represent? The trade-based the trade emissions. emissions associated with the movements of goods right. around the world from China, India, to the US, to Western Europe, all of those emissions are currently excluded from any of the UNFCC negotiations. So, so, so on your first question about the, the, the real opportunity costs and whether those can be met, uh, I mean, I, I think it's from the red experience that we need to look forward towards the green economy. And that's why I, was, I said earlier that the financing simply cannot be an afterthought. Um, the reality is, you know, as, as much as we move forward on red without, without the money being there, that mechanism simply doesn't, doesn't exist. Um, and that's really where I think the role, that, again, to highlight the role of the state uh, within that. I mean, I think that, that, that financing for red, of course, will only exist if there's a demand for those credits. And voluntary carbon market is, is a step in the right direction, but it's paltry, as, as you've pointed out during the annual meeting, really paltry in comparison. I'm slightly concerned that we're going to end up in a similar situation for green economy, where we get a handful of people willing to invest in mini hydro, handful of people willing to invest in certain types of SFM, but in terms of genuine economic transformation without some push behind it. Uh, now, that push can come from private sector. It can come from changes in, in market to consumer demand related to these no deforestation pledges. 
but I think the state has an awfully big role to play within that. Um, which brings to the second question, is the state you know, going to acknowledge this, you know, in terms of within the UNFCC process, these, 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 uh, these broader accounting measures to consider these other types of emissions, and are they going to, to get serious? And I, uh, you know, not being necessarily directly part of that process, I, I can't speak to them, but I'd, I'd be real surprised uh, if they're really ready to confront those issues. What I can, though, speak to is, is to myself as an academic and to us as an institution. They certainly don't have motivation to confront those issues if we don't present them with, with, clear, with clear science, flagging these as critical policy issues. And so we need to present the win-wins, we need to present the low-hanging fruits, but if we give those as a policy excuse to not deal with the difficult issues, then I think we, we undermine that process. Thanks, Jacob. It sounds like a great book chapter and the obvious answer to Rob Ur's question, C4 Green, which is uh, no, on display behind you. I guess just following on from, from that discussion with Andrew, um, what your um, presentation made me think about was uh, the, the business as usual baseline uh, and the role of the state. And you seem to imply, uh, perhaps um, by omission, that um, business as usual is sort of unconstrained development. And so my question is, is that really what you think? Um, shouldn't the role of the state, or might it not be that the role of the state's about setting um, a baseline for business as usual that is not business as usual as we experience it? Uh, because, as you rightly pointed out, against business as usual in an unconstrained situation, uh, any realistic expectation that green economy uh, funds will, will plug the gap is unrealistic. But have we got the wrong baseline? I think that's a. I think that's a fair point, and maybe I maybe I've overstated it a little bit. I mean, it's it's not unconstrained. Although I think some people would argue that in in certain parts of the world it is relatively unconstrained. Certainly not monitored. Um, uh, I mean, there are there are certainly are wild wests still out there, um, and unfortunately the agri you know the, the forest frontier is often that wild west, and these are the areas that that perhaps from our perspective matter most. Um, in terms of moving business as usual baselines, I mean, of course. This is really a, this is really becomes very quickly not a, not only a financing issue but a but a governance issue, um, and the extent to which, I mean, of course, it also varies across contexts. But the extent to which this business as usual baseline can be can be moved up, I think, is again really a question about about political will. Um, I mean, these are very very difficult transitions to make and ones in which often there are very strong financial and political vested interests. Um, so at the, risk of, at the risk of shying away from a dis difficult issue, I think I'd just come back to the fact that we need to think of ourselves within, as a research institute kind of within that about how we engage with these issues because it, you know, in so much as the world does or doesn't look to us and we set the tone of, we can set you know, tones of certain dialogues, I think that that we need to we need to be very clear about what we're what directions we're happy to move in and what directions we're we're perhaps a little bit more cautious with. And I think green economy is part of that. William, thanks for the great talk and for animating this this discussion. Um, I think um, much of what you said is is spot on. Um, in in the language of economics, I think we're in a situation where where the opportunity costs simply are not being paid. And, and yet, we're also in a situation where the nature of the calculus made by governance, uh, governments around the world um, about how to confront climate change is, is changing over time. Is there any room for optimism at all, given this, this gradual pace of, of change, that the, the calculus will change and create the regulatory framework? I completely agree that what's missing is the regulatory incentives to make um, something like red profitable, but is it possible that more governments will act like small island states in the near future? Uh, as I've as I've progressed in this kind of line of work, I've realized that it, it can be a very sobering career choice. Um, but but nonetheless, I think I think there are opportunities for yeah for for example. <laughs> um, but I think there is there is room for optimism, and in that respect, I think red can teach us a lot. Red started as, I would argue, you know, as, as simplistic. We'll pay you, you'll do it. But there's been a transition 
towards a recognition that, you know, as you know better than anyone, that these are issues of tenure, that these are issues of, of, of equity, and you know, a lot of the C4 work addresses those issues. And that mirrors part of a broader discussion and a recognition that provision of ecosystem services is not, it's not, it's not a traditional marketplace. Uh, and that these complex socio-ecological systems have a lot of moving parts and that we need to address those. And I think, perhaps in small part, thanks to work by C4, I think people, policymakers are seeing that more and more. Um, including with broader, you know, with broader accounting to consider uh, that you know, emissions, are not uh, emissions are not just one, from one sector. We have to deal, as Andrew was pointing out, with these difficult other sectors, even though that may be, may be challenging. So I think that it, one lesson that gives us perhaps optimism from RED is that, that the discourse has moved, and it's moved relatively quickly, and we've been moving with it. Uh, not an easy transition, but one that I think we're seeing in small fits and bursts kind of uh, moving and towards addressing a more holistic system. It's just the beginning. Uh, first of all, great discussion, great presentation, great discussion. I, I'd really like to say that I totally sympathize with, with the um, thinking that a natural capital accounting is way too simplified and we really need to get other value systems into, into the mix. And, and figuring out how to do that is, includes a lot of interesting research questions. I think this is actually at the core of the landscape thinking that we are trying to promote. So that, I really like that distinction. I really think we have some interesting questions to ask to those that promote natural capital accounting as the tool to, for the green economy. Secondly, um, I also think there are a lot of interesting research questions in, in the area of, of are we using the green economy paradigm as an excuse not to, to go down the regulatory route? I think that, that's a very interesting uh, uh, space to, to ask questions in. And then thirdly, um, and this is maybe more of a question, we seem to often talk about um, the issue being that too much money is made off the land. That seems to be a general way of, of thinking. But isn't it also the other way around, that many times too little money is made off the land, and that's why we're ending up in strange situations. For example, how, how do we balance intensification and making more money from land use with, um, what's the opposite, um, well, de-intensification, meaning uh, looking at other values uh, and, and balancing them with, with ec economics. So that's kind of a question, but more of a comment, I guess. Thank you, and thanks for the discussion. I mean, the, the land sparing, land sharing debate is not a, is not a new one. Um, and it's one that I've dabbled in a little bit, as, as, as Robert knows, uh, with, with varying levels of success. Um, but uh, the reality is, one of, one of my concerns is that, you know, intensifi the intensification, as we heard from Syngenta and Monsanto at Forest Asia, um, intensification does not yield reliable, no, does not always, in all circumstances, yield reliable outcomes. Intensification increases the value of doing agriculture on forested land, and so creates economic incentives to deforest. So it doesn't mean that deforestation will happen. It depends on, of course, there's a lot of spatial dimensions to that. But again, it brings us back to an important but perhaps sometimes sidelined actor, the state. And that's in some, you know, intensification, where intensification drives deforestation and creates new incentives to deforest. It's really the state in terms of spatial planning, uh, in terms of matching uh, you know, incentives with potentially red or PES payments, really needs to come in and address, address those drivers and, and, and reset the math. Um, and not only reset the math, but regulate, which is admittedly a difficult thing to do. But I think that research on how regulation and enforcement happens in practice and why it fails, rather than just relying on governance doesn't, you know, the, the enforcement fails, understanding how enforcement works, how enforcement fails, and getting into more nuanced research on how those are operationalized in the field is a really important area of research for C4. I would think that. Thank you, everybody. That concludes our science at 10. And uh, thanks again to Jacob and for all the questions.